Hi, welcome again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice, and my guest today is Robert McNeil. He has a new novel. It's about broadcast journalism. He's no stranger to newsrooms and TV studios. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Leslie. Now, you're a news guy. People think of you that in, in many respects. They've been watching you through the years down on PBS. When did you first start wanting to be a novelist? Before I was ever a journalist. Is that right? Yeah. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I wanted to be a creative writer. I was writing mostly plays, but I finished a novel in my late 20s. I had another one in the works. And I became a journalist who earned a living. But I never quite lost the desire to get back to that. In fact, I think it haunted me. And every so often during a journalistic career that was pretty interesting, I would say to myself late at night, why aren't you doing what you really set out to do? So you got sidetracked. I got sidetracked for, all for those 40 years. <laughs> yeah. What about that first novel? Did it get published? No, and it shouldn't have been. No, ah. absolutely no, no. Did you burn it, toss it away, or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Yeah, no it's one gone. will ever see no, it? No, no one will ever see it, no. no. And that was the right thing to do? It was the right thing to do, <laughs> yeah. It was really juvenile. I don't know if all yeah. readers could say that. Yeah. Um, after you move away from news... I haven't been able to burn all the plays yet. I've, uh, but you're saving I, them. I have a couple of those. Okay. Not that they're worth producing, it's just... It tears my heart to throw them away. Right. When you moved away from news and you started writing the novels, did that feel terribly liberating? I started while well, I was still working on the, on the um, news hour, and it did feel liberating, and it felt so liberating that I wanted to get out of it altogether, which I did three years ago. So this is, this is the first novel since I've been clear of, the, of journalism. Now, this also seems to me to be the first novel that you're uh, really having a lot more fun yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, I did. Tell me about that writing process and having the fun. Well, I've, you know, I've made a lot of boring speeches and written a lot of articles over the years, very earnest considerations of the state of TV journalism. My first book, published 30 years ago this year, yes. was The People Machine, was about that. And I'm bored with it. I'm bored with being earnest and solid about everything that's wrong with the state of but TV But you're still journalism. a critic of I'm still a critic, TV journalism. But I just sort. decided I wanted to have some fun. I wanted to clothe the issues or flesh, is there a word, and flesh the issues <laughs> in, in people who I thought would be typical of the characters in the business. And some of them are very funny. And some of them are sad. And some of them deserve to be satirized. And I think some of them don't, at least the ones I'm sympathetic to like the Anchorman, who is the main, main character here, they've been brilliantly ridiculed in, you know, like movies like Network and, yeah. and uh, Broadcast News. And I wanted to do a sympathetic portrait um, of, of a man in that position with some satirical strands around him. But I did have fun. Was some of that satire just kind of delivered to you from people that you have known in the business? It's just the there. It's yeah. there. I mean, I have a character in the book um, whom I imagine as a disgruntled worker in one of the network newsrooms, who creates a website and, uh, and creates a persona to allow him or her to say the most outrageous things. And uh, he, she calls herself, himself, Holly Go Lightly in sort of deference to Truman Capote. Right. But abbreviated to Holly Go uh, as the first black drag queen electronic gossip columnist. And that gives license to say the most outrageous things, and salacious sometimes, and bawdy, and I think very accurate and satirical. But a lot of it is the kind of things that people in network newsrooms tend to say about each other. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of humor. Sounds like an doesn't. interesting character. Yeah, I, I, I like the character. And, uh, and the, the other thing it provides is an opportunity to um, use nicknames for um, all the real networks and many of the um, um, people in the networks so that you don't have to invent, you know, fake names for the Columbia Broadcasting System like Consolidated Broadcasting. I just used 
nicknames, but it's Holigo who provides the satirical nicknames. She calls, he calls all the, he calls the networks taupe, beige, and bisque, uh, which are the colors of sort of old-fashioned lingerie colors, yeah. and it just, it, it, it's part of the, part of the fun I had with it. Well, something that comes up in the book, of course, is the, the idea that, that all the networks, the big networks, are, are more or less the same, and we'll say that yeah. maybe PBS is different, but yeah. mm -hmm. do you have that feeling? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, there are little differences in personality, uh, and it used to be thought that different networks had different demographics watching them. It was always thought that CBS had an older, slightly older average audience for its news programs than the others. I don't know whether that's true anymore. They're all so closely bunched together in the ratings as they try and resist the erosion of share that just goes, seems to go on inexorably. Hmm. Uh, Walter Cronkite says of this book, the best explanation yet of what ails television news. What is it that ails television news? Well, I, I don't know whether it's one thing. It is a changed marketplace with a proliferation of channels, especially in the States, but here to some extent. And as that produces more competition for eyeballs, some of those outlets are doing more and more desperate or sensational or scandalous things to get the eyeballs. And that in turn is putting the fear of God into the, the traditional news networks who worry that some of their viewers, some more of their viewers will uh, slip away into the glitzy, um, you know, into the fun palaces of the, uh, of the tabloid news shows. So that's really what I think is wrong with it. And that has led, that has, that has been created in part because news is now regarded as a business um, and as a bottom line business, either in itself or as a contributor to a corporation which owns many different businesses. And what we've lost is the kind of sense of balance that there used to be between the profit making from the entertainment side and using the news as a sort of lost leader that earned prestige for the networks. That's gone. And now everybody's after the buck and everybody's after the eyeballs. And, and of course, this gets to something that you worry very deeply about is that relationship between integrity and ratings. Is yeah. it possible to maintain your integrity as a, as a newsman at that, that level? But, well, you can kind of convince yourself that you're doing it. And that's part of the, um, of the poignant um, situation of my anchorman. He's convinced that he's holding the line. Mm -hmm. The guy in the novel, who's a Time magazine writer, who's writing a profile of him, gradually becomes convinced that Grant Monroe, my hero, thinks he's holding the line. As a sailor, he's making little corrections to his course all yes. the time, yeah. but that a larger tide is carrying him in his boat even as he's making his corrections uh, further out to where he doesn't want to go. And the Time magazine guy eventually comes to the conclusion. He says to his girlfriend, uh, Grant Monroe is a great guy. And, you know, he's done many interesting things and everything, but he doesn't get it. And she says, he doesn't get what? And he says that the battle he's fighting is over. Hmm. That sounds like it's pretty much impossible within that environment to, to stay the course then, to follow your, your, your sailing motif. Well, look, well, look, look at, um, look at uh, for instance, Dan Rather and uh, Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings, who are all, uh, who are all serious journalists and who grew up in a generation when television was trying to be as dignified and as serious in its approach to the news, although for a wider audience, as the serious newspapers. And now they have to do things like lead the news every night, as two of those networks did during the O.J. Simpson trial on O.J. Mm. Even though there wasn't a signif really significant news development many nights, not because they thought it was the most important thing that had happened in the world that day, but because they feared if they didn't, some of their viewers, some more of their viewers, might slide away yes. into the cable channels that were running OJ all the time. Recently, um, they've all commented on this, they were all lined up uh, in Cuba to uh, watch the Pope meet Fidel Castro. And then came word of the Monica Lewinsky-Clinton affair, and they all packed up immediately, forgot the Pope story, and hightailed it back to New York. Wow. Uh, Dan Rather said publicly that um, it, he very much regretted doing it, but it was impossible not to do it. And he also said, fear m rules the newsroom now. That is, that is pretty scary. What about the facts? How does the, the viewer know what's an allegation, what's uh, a provable fact, and what's just a 
juicy tidbit that somebody overheard somewhere? Um, if you, I think like anything else, you have to go to a source you trust. And by and large, I think the uh, traditional networks have tried to give you facts based on good sourcing. They did slip in the last year during the Lewinsky story, and they've more or less said they did. You know, they were, they were in such a rush to be competitive on a story that just, the story was like a dam bursting, and everybody got swept through the dam, and all the, they were like flotsam and jetsam roaring through a broken dam. And, and many of them, in anxiety, in their anxiety not to seem to be behind on the story, went on the air with leak one source or reported that another person, another network, another source had reported something. It is reported that became, you know, yeah, very so standard. Like and uh, even with even weaker sourcing than that, and many of them have turned around since then and decried that and deplored it and said they would have to watch themselves in the future. So but somebody's trying to shore up the dam. Yeah, well, I think, I think, yeah, I think, my, I think my anger man is trying to shore up the mm -hmm. dam. He feels yeah. that he's putting fingers in the dikes every day and that there are more, every time he puts a finger in one place, like Hans Brinker, there's, there's, um, there's, another, there's another hole. And they, they are trying. Um, but I think each time there is a more extreme story I mean, there's a line in my book where this anchorman talks about um, when he's giving a speech at the beginning of the book to the radio, television, news directors. He says, are we, every time there is a big and sensational story, going to ratchet up this absurd competitiveness, and are we going to de jettison more and more journalistic standards every time? It's easy, uh, and they do it. We, the industry, does it. After each major um, excess, right, um, everybody, you know, they go to earnest seminars and symposia and sit down and say, how can we do it better? How can we draw back from, um, from this wholesale rush into tabloid values? And they mean it, and they do try, and then the next big story comes along and it seems to get yeah, even more extreme the next time. Back, yeah. um, if you look at the escalation in that kind of behavior from O.J. Simpson to Princess Di to Clinton Lewinsky, God knows where it's going to go the next time. Are there voices of, dare I use the phrase, social responsibility that, that creep back into these, these uh, boardrooms where the editorial type decisions are being made that say, okay, well, we did, you know, we did the sleaze there, let's get back down to Nicaragua and make sure, sure. that we get a good yes. story. Yeah, that, that, that happens all the time. And then it, uh, but, there are also conversations. You have to distinguish between boardroom, corporate boardrooms, yes. okay. who are interested in what the Wall Street analysts are going to say every quarter and what the stock price is going to do, and people in the newsrooms who are having the editorial conferences. And they have conversations every day, like the one between my anchorman, who's 60, and the young executive producer. And it goes something like this. What should we lead on tonight? And the anchorman says, well, we should lead on the Middle East peace talks. That's the most important thing that happened today. And the young executive producer, whose job it is to get the ratings up, says, yeah, yeah, sure it is. But we've got pictures of the cute nine-year-old girl who was found raped and murdered in the woods on her mother's Wyoming ranch. The mother is a little movie star. Cute and poignant as hell home movies of her. And what have you got for the Middle East talks? You've got suits walking in and out of buildings. Yes. And maybe for excitement, you have a suit with no tie on. But um, that kind of conversation goes on all the time, and more and more, the little girl found in the woods makes the lead, because it's the most poignant, gripping, sensational stories. And the, the people in the boardrooms above are sending the message down continually that we have to have these ratings. Well, I, the, the, one of the things that really fascinates me, and I don't quite know the answer to it, but is the divorce between a sense of social responsibility there and down at the newsrooms where they really do it every day. The message, it seems to me, that increasingly comes down from the boardrooms is get the ratings up, get the costs down. All those networks have recently been cutting back on their news departments. They're, they've been pulling in their foreign bureaus because their audience surveys tell them they don't, uh, that there isn't uh, right. as much interest in foreign news. They've been cutting staffs uh, very heavily. And so that's the message, I think, that comes down from the boardrooms. Mm. 
Okay, we're going to take a short break. My guest today is Robert McNeil. We'll be back talking about the news business and talking about his new novel, Breaking News, right after this. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to Off the Page. My guest is Robert McNeil. He has a new novel out, but you know, I do want to go back to the beginning of your career there. How did you get into news? You gave up on novels, writing novels, and uh, what, what lured you into that field? The need to make a living. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, um, the, uh, the plays I was writing weren't uh, getting produced. And was this back in Halifax? Th this was in London. Mm -hmm. No, I left Halifax and uh, ended up in Ottawa where I was working and going to Carleton, and when I got my degree, I went to London, thinking that was the place to go and be a writer. Something came out of the word in one of the, your biographies there, bohemian. Yeah. Were you well, leading a bohemian lifestyle there? Well, it, the time? mildly so. Mildly, mildly so. In would, a Canadian it, 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 it would seem very square, I think, to, uh, <laughs> to kids today. So I, I'm not going to get the word I details? I mean, a bohemian with a shirt and tie on every day. Is, okay. <laughs> uh, but um, the... Uh, so, no, I, I, I just needed, I was, I was getting married, and a kid was coming along, and I had to have a job. So I, I got a job uh, at Reuters News Agency in London, and they trained me for five years, and then NBC picked me up from there and brought me back to the States eventually. And so it got pretty interesting. And uh, then I quit NBC and went to work for the BBC for eight years before going back to work for public television. So 40 years altogether, uh, it was, um, it was, that was, there was you a big were. block of time. I kind of wonder where it all went. Forty years. Pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, did you hang on to your Canadian identity? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think, well, I think, no, I jettisoned it for a while mm -hmm. because I really didn't have one. And, and that's one of the, uh, it was one of the uh, things that our, some people in our generation seem to lack. We knew where we were from Canada. But culturally, exciting things seem, seem to be happening somewhere else, either in the States or Britain. We didn't have a strong Canadian cultural identity. You know, I grew up in the 30s and 40s. I was a teenager during the Second World War. And uh, the books we read were all American books or British books sure. or French books or something. And I, I, I've, I've written this um, so in one of my books. I felt I grew up among a people who were not written about, who were not the subject of literature. The people we read about who were the subject of adventures were English people or French people yes. or Russian people or American people. They must be more interesting people, I of thought. Of course, people are writing us. books about them. Yeah, people yeah. are writing books about them. Mm. Now, it, took me, it took me quite a while to discover that, um, you know, you could, be, you could write books about Canadians, too. Now, you seem to be suggesting that that has changed oh, that's dramatically changed. Oh, to today. Enormously. Enormously. No young person growing up in Canada today need feel that there's some species not interesting enough to have stories written about them. Right. And because there's just... And it, and it swells every year. I mean, the growth of Canadian literature over the last 30 years is extraordinary. And more and more good writers come up every year. Do you see yourself as part of that? I mean, much of what you're I'd writing like, is within an American tradition. Yeah, well, I'd like to be. Uh, I'd like to be thought of that way. I mean, obviously, I have a foot in the states, and um, um, but uh, the books that have um, opened me up to myself, I think, are very Canadian. Uh, Wordstruck, which is about growing up in Halifax. Yes. And, and, uh, and Burden of Desire, which was about uh, the Halifax Explosion, sure, that's a very it, Halifax it? book. Mm -hmm. The Voyage is a novel about a Canadian diplomat. And although he's all over the world, his sensibility and his, and his political references and his uh, attitudes to Trudeau and Mulroney, and thing, I mean, it's all Canadian. I sort of get a vision, too, of uh, in the United States, maybe it, it does take a Canadian to bring a certain amount of integrity to American popular culture and American broadcast journalism. Did you ever see no, yourself I as don't. a little bit of the Lone Ranger? There? No, I don't think yeah? that's true. I don't think that's true. There are lots of people, lots of Americans who are trying to bring integrity to, and do, to right. a, a popular culture. I mean, um, one of the interesting things about the United States, once you get used to it as a Canadian and get over your initial kind of prickliness or sense of cultural superiority, yeah. um, is to discover 
that there are as many people in the United States who have what we could call a Canadian sensibility. Mm -hmm. I don't mean Canadian patriotism and nationalism, but I mean have an aesthetic sensibility that is somewhat like the one you're describing. Oh, that's we think interesting. Of. That's um, and probably there are many, many millions more in the United States. So um, so. I've, I've, oh, yes, I mean, the United States is full of, uh, not full of, but has lots of people just as sensitive and uh, as aesthetically demanding as and as refined as Canada does. Sure, it also has superb writers. Yes. Um, you know, also, and, and people with just as exquisite a sensibility and, um, and, uh, and an understanding of, you know, the subtle things of the human heart. I mean, Americans, 270 million Americans, are not all the crassest kinds of consumer-driven um, uh, puppets of, of the uh, capitalist market um, culture that uh, Canadians might some, sometimes like to think. And it, on the contrary, um, many Canadian, C Canada now has been seriously invaded, I think, by lots of the crasser forms of American consumerism. So, Okay, well said. I, I could go on and on. All right, on, yes, but, you, you've mm, defended America. <laughs> All right, I defend America. Now do you want me to defend Canada? No, uh, I want to take you back to something you, you mentioned okay. earlier there, uh, yeah. the, the book Word Struck, and of course you've written a book about the English language. You do have a very genuine and serious love of the English language itself. Yeah. How, where did that come from? I suppose it came from being read to um, very generously um, and creatively during the late 30s and 40s, from the time I was about four or five up till I was 11 or 12, I guess, um, by my mother, because my father was away at sea, um, first with the RCMP Marine Section out of Halifax and then with the Canadian Navy during the war. And they had books around, and books were there, were a principal entertainment for them. So I was lucky enough to grow up, grow up in a family with lots of books and who loved books and could lose themselves in books for an afternoon or weep over a book as it's my the, mother the would The sound do. of the word and read this, out and loud? Yeah, the, and, and, and my mother was a great reader and when she would read Dickens or Robert Louis Stevenson, she would read it with great effect. And then I spent um, many years going to um, an Anglican church and for four years I sang in the um, uh, choir at um, All Saints Cathedral. And that means that you are exposed to some of the greatest prose in the English language through the Book of Common Prayer, the way that, has, that transmits that um, um, 17th century um, wonderful English prose from the people who made the, uh, who made the Book of Common Prayer out of, the, um, out of the King James Version of the Bible. And so that, those patterns, they say that Southern writers are so um, gifted in language because they were steeped in the Bible and, some, and, and in the storytelling tradition. Well, certainly the Bible, the King James Bible and the Book of Common Prayer were exposed, I was exposed to that the way kids are exposed to um, a lot of rock music today. My guest today is Robert McNeil. We're going to take a very short break and we'll be back to say goodbye after this. <laughs> You've been watching off the page today. My guest has been Robert McNeil. Robert, thanks for coming and being on the show. Thank you, Leslie. And I hope we'll see you again next time. Bye.